and and of course the the history of slavery which definitely implicates Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island and Ontario and Quebec. Uh, all these uh, five eastern provinces uh, all were colonial, uh, in terms of colonial Canada, were all slaveholding societies. And especially Nova Scotia, and I say especially Nova Scotia not because they had the most slaves, but because Nova Scotia was really settled in terms of governance by slaveholders. So one reason why race relations in Nova Scotia tend to appear to be more pitched and more American than black-white race relations, especially elsewhere in the country, is because Nova Scotia was settled by people who would have been Americans in another 20, 30 years. Right. Uh, these are, Nova Scotia mainland was settled by planters who came from the South and came from New England. They were Yankees and they were Dixies. They were the government class in Nova Scotia. They established the colony of Nova Scotia. And they came in as slaveholders. They kicked out the Acadians, 1755. They arrived in 1760. Did they bring the slaves? Yes, of course, hundreds, hundreds. So Nova Scotia begins as a slaveholding society. So what year, this, what year is this? 1760, 1760, when the planters arrive. And yeah. the, so the legislature, in, the legislature in Halifax is one of the oldest legislatures in Canada, right? Yeah. It's like 17, 16, yeah. 17, 17, 17, at the same time in there. That's right. So these these planters, as it were, they were former Brits, as it were, oh, who had moved south and spent their 10, 20, 30, or 100 years and then moved up. Is that right? Well, yeah. Originally, it would have all been from, from England, Scotland, Ireland, and so on. But by the time they came to Nova Scotia, they were Yankees. They may not have yet called themselves Americans because America didn't yet exist. They were Yankees. But they were Yankees. And if they had not made the move in 1760 to Nova Scotia, in 1776, they would have been amongst the, the rebels against the British. So when they arrived in Nova Scotia, they came with them, or they brought with them an ideology that was already Yankee, that was already pro-slavery, that was already... A, of course, the British were pro-slavery too, so no big, no big deal. So this is the Cornwallis statue in Halifax, which is a particularly sore point of all the statues across all this country. <laughs> there are a lot of histories. Well, John there. East uh, but as Cornwallis well. Cornwallis is, you know, was a was a kind of a strike point to say, what is yeah. the statue of this guy standing proudly in in the capital city of Nova Scotia? Well, he he establishes Halifax, seventeen forty nine, uh, and he did come directly from England. Um, and, and of course, a name for the Earl of Halifax. And of course, uh, some may know, or many may know, that there is a Halifax in England, which I must go and visit someday. Uh, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's bigger or smaller than Halifax, Nova Scotia. But anyway, um, uh, it's a side point. But nevertheless, uh, Cornwallis arrived to establish Halifax as essentially a military outpost. That's another point, too, that gets lost. And of course, North Art Fry talks about the garrison. Uh, mentality and, and so forth in, in terms of the development of colonial Canada. But Halifax really was a garrison city. Uh, and the reason why was because of Fortress Louisbourg, which was, of course, a bastion of French power. Um, and the Americans, or people who were going to become Americans, another generation, re really felt threatened by France and felt threatened by uh, Fortress Louisbourg. So they needed to have a port where they could muster their military vessels, sailing ships, of course, uh, in order to attack uh, Louisbourg. And Halifax was the best port from which to make that operation because uh, it's ice-free year-round. Now, in the days of sail, having an ice-free port in the North Atlantic gave you a huge advantage over all the other European militaristic imperialist powers uh, active in the area, which basically would have been France right. for the most part. No Spain, no Spain, no Portugal. No, they Holland, were been, Holland's done. Yeah, uh, Germany ever tried? No, they didn't exist yet. They didn't exist yet. That's yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, uh, Prussia organized Germany in the mid nineteenth century. That's right. right. Um, but but uh, in any event, uh, so in the contest with with France, Halifax was, became a major military asset. And that's another point, too, in terms of us discussing race relations earlier. Not only was Nova Scotia founded as a slaveholding colony, well, like others as well, but particularly because of the fact that its base was American or Yankee, it had a whole different attitude. It was very serious about, about slavery. 
uh, as was New France, which is now Quebec, but New France, in fact, had the most slaves, 5,000. So, so the, the slave owners in the new Nova Scotia, so to speak, they didn't have cotton farms. So what were they? They used their slaves for the cornfields or the lumber yards or the fish or... Yeah, a little bit of, of, of everything. Small-scale operations because the economy, uh, sorry, the climate did not allow for major plantation-type right. farming. So. Uh, the slaves who were brought in were brought in as essentially household servants because these were aristocrats as well. So if you're going to be an aristocrat, you've got to have a few servants who, of course, are, are slaves. Uh, but they were also used for apple uh, harvesting um, and, and orchard work. Uh, many people may not know that, that uh, for a long time, well into the 20th century, um, uh, along with cod, along with the fisheries, Halifax, or sorry, Nova Scotia made a lot of money uh, selling apples, especially to Britain. So the apple uh, harvest was very important, and so slaves were used uh, in the apple industry uh, uh, early on with the arrival of, of, the, of the planters.